What is up, everybody? Welcome to Culture FC, the weekly soccer show that's not really about soccer. We cover lifestyle, music, fashion, politics, all the things surrounding the beautiful game, just none of the results happening on the pitch. My name is Louis. I'm Brendan. And this week, we dove into quite a few different topics. Our main topic of this week was the Canadian Premier League. Eh? It, rec- <laughs> it recently launched about two weeks ago, and it is the top flight league of soccer in Canada. Their first professional league since 1992. So we spent some time talking about it, how it will impact American soccer, what it means for Canada, and just a little bit about what the league is, how it's structured, and how it's different from the MLS. We also spent quite a bit of time talking about Ajax and Barcelona, what it would mean if both of these clubs reached the final of the Champions League, especially with both clubs being so influenced by Johan Cruyff and having such a deep connection to one another. We also talked a little bit about how the Notre Dame Cathedral burnt down and what PSG and people in France did to kind of help rebuild it. And we actually spent quite a bit of time talking about Game of Thrones and how it relates to soccer. And we also spent quite a while talking about Game of Thrones. Don't worry, no spoilers, and it was definitely soccer related. We didn't spend... Okay, we did spend quite a bit of time rambling, but that's okay. (laughs) If you enjoyed this episode, it would mean the world to us if you could leave us an honest review on your favorite podcasting app. We are trying to get better, we're trying to grow, but we need your help and your feedback to do so. So please leave us an honest review or even DM us what you think about the show and how we can get better. We really, really appreciate any kind of feedback you guys can give us. If you guys can't get enough of us and our content, you can follow us on all of our socials at Trouble Soccer, or you can check out our brand new redesigned website, www.troublesoccer.com. We have been posting a lot of blogs recently, um, a lot of cool, interesting news topics and giving you our take more often than just in this weekly podcast. So definitely check that out. But that's enough of me rambling, guys. Let's jump into this week's episode. All right, so jumping into our first news topic of this week. Uh, This did happen quite a few weeks ago, and uh, people have probably already seen this quite a bit, but uh, we didn't talk about it because I was gone in Spain, (laughs) and so I figured let's do it now. Especially because the the morning that you guys are probably going to be listening to this, there will be a Champions League game, so it is relevant. But anyway, uh, this news topic is that the Dutch FA canceled an entire round of games in the Dutch League to give Ajax enough rest for their semifinal matchup against Tottenham. And I wanted to get your thoughts on this. Basically, this is the league showing favoritism to one of its teams just to help it advance further in the Champions League. What are your initial thoughts? Do you think they should have done it? Do you find it weird? Do you find it soft? I don't find it soft at all. I think, you know, if you have confidence within that team, even making it to the the finals, Ajax would pull enough money that would, I think equal or be greater than the current amount that they spent this year so that alone and then just tied to the fact that like it it brings more eyes maybe on the dutch league itself am i partial because i'm dutch yeah but like that doesn't really matter um i think it's but at the same time you do you do kind of question it's it's a little it's like really like so you're it's kind of giving them like it's it's literally giving them a handicap to a sense like all these other teams' leagues are still going on. Like, Tottenham's still playing. Right. And then, like, I actually, like, no, no, we don't, we don't have any more it's, games. It's such a crazy thing. Like, I, I, at first, I'm like, man, is it, is it fair if you're the other clubs? Like, are you the, if you're the other club supporters, like, how do you feel about this? Where you're like, why the hell do we have to spend an extra week, like, playing games? Um, or play games a week longer than everyone else just because Ajax needs a little break for the Champions League. But then I think you kind of hit the nail on the head with how I feel about it, where, you know, they probably all banded together and was like, hey, this is really amazing for Dutch football that we have a Dutch team potentially going to a final of a Champions League. And so for them, they were like, you know what? The good outweighs the bad, especially because Dutch soccer has been in such a weird place over the last 20 or so years. Like, I mean, I guess the Dutch national team up until 2010 was very, very good, but then fell off hard. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Dutch teams weren't making it super far into the Champions League, especially because the last great Dutch side was the Ajax 95 side that had, like, some absolute legends on it. And they ended up going on to win the Champions League in 95. Um, and so, in a way, I almost think it's pretty cool where they're like, you know what? We'll put our differences aside. We will cancel the league for this week, which will hopefully give, you know, Dutch football as a whole... A, a better opportunity to progress, especially because this Ajax team has some really good young Dutch talent. And I think it'd be very different if, let's say, Ajax had a team made up of a bunch of foreigners 
right? Like, imagine if it was an Ajax team that was with a bunch of players that were bought from outside and, True. like, if they weren't Dutch. Then I feel like the rest of the league would be like, you know what? Why would we give you any preference? Like, just, you're not really perpetuating Dutch football. You're just perpetuating your club. But I think that because there's so much promise in these young guys, in, like, you know, in, in De Young and De Ligt, like, these are two young superstars that could potentially put Dutch football back on the map completely. Yeah. Like, imagine they go on to win it. Oh, I know. It'd be it'd be insane because they are a bunch of young guys. A bunch of young dudes. Like, uh, Mateus Licht is like 19 or 20. Like, De Jong is also like 20. Like, these dudes are ballers, but yeah, it's crazy. And man. playing and besting some of the best players that, like, have played the game. They have beaten, this season, they have beaten Bayern. They have beaten Real Madrid and they've beaten Juventus. Those are three very big clubs. <laughs> and... I I I only want I want them to go to the very end. Be- I I've been ever since United got knocked out. I've been pulling for Ajax because I think it's awesome. Is there is this game at where is it? So the, the Champions League this, this the, next leg is it at the next leg is actually in. I'm pretty sure it's in Amsterdam. If I'm not mistaken, the leg that will be on the day that this podcast is released. Pretty sure the first leg was in London, and then the second leg it will be in Amsterdam. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. You are correct. So, in other words, they're probably making it to a Champions League final. Of course, yeah. you never know, and knock on wood, things can, can happen. Can you imagine, because of the whole rest of the league being canceled for that week, how many people in the country, like in the Netherlands, will watch that game? I, I'm trying to remember if it was for last week's game or for this week's game. Either way, I, I, this these the TV ratings for this game against Tottenham is going to be nuts regardless. Absolutely nuts. Um, But... Looking forward to it. Absolutely. But what's really interesting about um, still talking about, you know, Ajax and the Champions League, you know, we typically just try to stay away from results on the field. But something that I that has come about recently that I think is so interesting is that if Ajax play Barcelona in the final of the Champions League, there will be potentially two different trebles on the line. Wow. Ajax just won the Dutch Cup this past weekend, I believe, and they are on track to win the Dutch League. Barcelona has wrapped up the league, and I believe they they are most likely going to win the the Copa del Rey if they not have if they have not won it. Give me one second; I'm going to look it up right now to see if they've already won it. And I mean, we never know because oh. Liverpool still have the chance to you know come back from three nothing. Okay. Not talking about scores or anything, <laughs> but you know it's happened once before. Let's do it again. <laughs> It's possible, it's possible, fair enough. It's possible. But in the hypo- hypothetical of Barcelona meeting Ajax and the potential of having two troubles on the line, Barca still has to play the Copa del Rey on the 25th of May. So there is a chance that at the end, when it's all said and done, if Barcelona beat Valencia and Ajax win the league and they meet in the final, not only, like, I think you guys have to understand, like, troubles are not common. No. They are not, they don't happen very often. Um, but... It's weird from both sides because if Barcelona win the treble, they will it'll be their third treble in like 15 years, which is insane because for a club that had prior to the 90s and prior to the 80s had not really been a world power and actually if you really think about it they became a world power with Messi and Ronaldinho in that era, but you know, if they were to win their third treble within 15 years, like that says a lot about a lot what Barcelona represent. I mean, back in 2015 when they won it it was Neymar, Messi, and Suarez. They had the most phenomenal year. They won everything that year with Luis Enrique. And, you know, sometimes when you you might almost be like, oh, but like, you know, Barcelona can walk in the Spanish League. But no, they can't. Because at the same time that they were winning a treble in 2015, Real Madrid, their biggest rival in the Spanish League, had between that treble winning season for Barcelona was sandwiched by two Champions League winning seasons by Real Madrid. Because in 2014, Real Madrid won the, cha- the Champions League. And then in 2015, they, or in 2016, they won the Champions League. And Barcelona won it in between them. So it wasn't easy for no. that Barcelona team to win that treble. But it's just astounding. And for Ajax, this is a team that they would be... Essentially written off. They wouldn't like... No one was really giving taking no. them too, too seriously. But yeah. this is a young team. And if they imagine if they were to win a treble. Think of like these players would be forever etched in history above some of the most famous players we even know. <laughs> At such a young age. <laughs> like it would be absurd. Oh. Um, and, and you know, the connections don't stop there. And quite frankly, if a final between Barcelona and Ajax were to be played, 
they're going to have to label it like the Johan Cruyff Derby. Because if you guys <laughs> don't know, um, Barcelona and Ajax have a very strong connection because a lot of the players that have been stars for Ajax have gone on to be stars for Barcelona. Uh, you have players like Luis Suarez, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, Michael Laudrup, Patrick Kluivert, Frank De Boer, and... Uh, you know, countless others. But the main biggest one who has shaped the fortunes of both clubs was Johan Cruyff as both a player for both clubs and as a manager for both clubs. This is a guy who they literally named Ajax's new stadium after him. Ajax currently play in the Johan Cruyff arena. And both like you want to say that like maybe because he was Dutch, he meant more to Ajax. But no, he adopted Barcelona and a Barcelona adopted him and he lived majority of his life in the city of Barcelona and like this dude loved it and he really shaped and changed the fortune of uh FC Barcelona like it's it's oh big time because before they were very you know they, they weren't that great until he joined and he joined and revolutionized everything and for Ajax you know he was the manager of course but he also won three European cups as a player for Ajax in the 70s like that's crazy like Dutch clubs like they're Yes, they're big and Ajax is a massive club, but it seems like in the modern game, they've kind of fallen behind. So, you know, it's crazy to see that they've tried to make it back to this top. But then as a Barcelona manager, he won them their first Champions League in 1991-92. Like, that's big time for them as well. So, if I'm not mistaken, it was their first or their second. I can't really recall uh, how many, the, your, when Barcelona won their first European Cup. But basically, to recap everything... Johan Cruyff meant so much to both of these clubs that it would be amazing if the two clubs that he helped, the two clubs that he helped build, were facing off in the final of the European Cup. Yeah, for his family, just for the the people who idolize him, I think that would be like the epitome of of Johan. It would be Cause, really cool. Because in a weird way, no I don't matter. See it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you think about it, like you know, whoever wins that game, if again this is a hypothetical, if, there is big, still a chance that if. Liverpool and Tottenham can make an advance. I'm just writing don't them write off now off. myself. Yeah, come on. Uh, but you know, it is hypothetical. It's just crazy because no matter who wins, Johan Cruyff wins at the end. Because you know, it's just showing how much of an influence he had on the game. So many years after he he you know he stopped managing and playing for both clubs, and many years after his death. So I think that would be really cool. Super cool. Another interesting topic and news item that happened while I was away was that you guys are probably you probably saw it in the news that the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris basically burnt down. You saw that? I did see that. It was tragic. Really, really tragic. But what was really cool about it was the um, the outpouring of support from pretty much everywhere as, uh, as soon as it happened. I remember seeing this a couple while, uh, a little while back, but I wanted to bring it up to you. B, uh, there was a store in Paris that was printing PSG replica shirts with a golden Notre Dame image, and they would donate ten euro to the fundraising fundraising campaign to rebuild the cathedral with the purchase of each one. And so that was already cool in and of itself to basically turn football into a way, help fundraise and help a very public good cause. It's for charity, essentially. But what was really cool is that PSG actually wore a special patch on their shirt in honor of the cathedral. And so I wanted to get your thoughts. What did you think about this and, and just in general? Um, I think the replica jersey looked super cool. Um they sold on PSG's website the jerseys that they wore with the oh, with awesome. the white patch. Unfortunately, they're all sold out. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, if if you guys are trying to get them, you can't. Um, but the jersey, I think, just to kind of bring current events in to the fray, and like actually, they wore them in a game, and like that in itself is really something to be said about what football does for popular culture and just current affairs like they're so intermingled so i think people look to say a soccer game you know like after something like that happened and to see the the the, the best team and like the best team wearing it i really think it epitomizes like the humanity and i think that's the biggest point is that we always say it too man football is so much bigger than just the sport it's about the community it's about the the culture surrounding the, the the club and the fact that, you know, like you said, people were looking to this game and, and football really is escapism. It's to escape the problems of every everyday life. And like, just the fact that like, you know, that this means so much to the people of France and to the people of the world and the people of Paris, like being able to do something and contribute to the reconstruction of the, of the church through football is incredible because 
it's wh- it's in these moments when football starts to break down walls that I really it gives me all warm and tingly in the inside. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> it just shows that like you know we're humans and there's a humanity to the game that we're playing. It's not just corporate sellouts. And yeah, of course, PSG probably made some money off of these shirts and it helped sales, but it doesn't matter. You know, it's the fact that they were able to contribute to the fund to rebuild the Notre Dame. And it's, it's just really cool to really understand the humanity that exists in soccer. And so I think that was really cool. And I loved that aspect of it. And you can still get the replica ones online. I just found them. Which is good because, I mean, they should keep it going for next season too because it's just a patch. It takes two seconds to add it on. If it means that they can donate more money to the cause, then by all means. I don't know. I I thought that was really important that when when it really starts to showcase the humanity that soccer can exhibit. Yeah. Of course, sometimes there's... There's so many instances where the money trumps the humanity and the money trumps whatever in football. And so whenever you have a feel good story like this, it, it is good. And such a visible thing, too. You know, sometimes like the poppy, you know, or like, like the poppy seed in England or yeah. like um, like the poppy flower. Sorry. The LGBT rainbow captain armbands, the armbands or the black yeah. armbands, you know, yeah. but having that right front and center definitely says a lot. It's, it's way more noticeable. Absolutely. I think so. Hats off. But then on a lighter note for our last bit of news before we dive into this week's main topic, we know Russia's crazy. We've talked about (laughs) Russia being crazy on the show before. I'm sure you don't need an explanation from me as to why Russia is crazy, but something very interesting happened recently. The Night King showed up to watch Lokomotiv Moscow's Russian Premier League match against Yenisei. So... (laughs) I actually blogged about this the other day, and it should be up on the website if you're listening to this now. You can check it out. But basically, during a Locomotive Moscow match, all of a sudden you look over one end of the field, and it's a big ass white sheet and just a the iron throne in the center of it with lights all facing it, and the Night King sitting on the iron throne. This was a TIFO for Locomotive Moscow to intimidate the other players. But then you think about it, they had to clear an entire section. Put a yep. giant white tarp everywhere and then put an iron throne and pay a dude or have a dude sit on the iron throne in full makeup and dress. And it was actually incredible. I saw clips of it. It looked like it was like an HBO sanctioned <laughs> like it looked promotion. Super legit. It yeah. looked incredibly legitimate. And it's amazing to see the amount of organization and time that it was put put into some of these TIFOs. That could be done in other social, <laughs> maybe other like more benefiting ways. Yeah, but when you, but if you say that like soccer doesn't win because this was a big win for soccer. Like, yeah, this is a massive tifo. Like it took probably a lot of time and effort to big coordinate tr- all of this. <laughs> but it, it's you know it's what makes soccer so amazing. Like yeah, we've had really cool tifos here in the MLS too, but not to this level. Not to high, no. not to clear an entire section and have no. one dude sitting in an iron throne. Yeah, that's true. It looked it looked very menacing. It looked very very menacing. It looked visceral. Like yeah. it had all the lights on it. The, yeah. It was a really good makeup it job. It was by the super guy. it looked that's what I'm saying, dude. It looked like <laughs> HBO came in. And I was like at first when I saw it cuz I didn't read into it at all. You just watch videos. Um, it's probably it's it probably threw you. Uh, off. It threw me off big time. I was like, "Why the fuck is HBO <laughs> watching a, a locomotive game? Like, of all the of all the places to go, they go to Russia." <laughs> like, <laughs> but uh, now I found out it was a TV show. So that's cool. But it is. I mean, it's cool though. Like, it's just awesome. It just it also shows the absolute far reaching nature that Game of Thrones has in 2019. Oh my god. Such a far reaching. It's absurd. Have uh, you watched? Did you watch this week's episode? Yes, I watched this week's episode. We won't spoil it for you. But no. What, what I will say, like, it's it's genuinely incredible to see, like, you know, shows come about and like people talk about like there's a show of a generation. Like, I feel like the last show that like everybody watched that everybody talked about was like Breaking Bad. Yeah, but Breaking that Bad. was like early. That was like mid to late 2000s, yeah. right? Like 2008, 2009. I feel like Lost had a huge cult following. Lost too. was another one of those that for a long time, it was that show that encapsulated everybody. Yep. But I feel like Lost started to lose people towards the end. Yeah. Because I feel like the last couple of seasons. Yeah, Game of Thrones has yeah. is, is consistently made everyone come back. Even after what what it was, two year hiatus, was it? One and a half. Uh, yeah, it was two full years yeah. because they were supposed to air one last year, but they didn't. Yep. And then now they're airing it this year. 
Um, but every time you log in and watch on Sunday, man, you just think, damn, there's one less episode to watch than the I season. Know. There's but, what? Uh, how many have there been? There's, there's been four there's now? Been four now. There's, there's two, left. two left. It's crazy. So the next episode's going to get wild. They said it was the big, uh, the biggest episode, even bigger than the, the last episode. Oh, my God. Yeah. I don't know I'm really trying to be. say this without spoiling I know. <laughs> well, we can just cut it out. No, I mean, like it. I just don't want to... I feel we're. I'm gonna make double check that I'm not spoiling anything for anybody and just leave it in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no. I, so I was in the supermarket the other day and I, I realized like okay, so there's Game of Thrones Oreos and I was thinking like man, this is the kind of show that like everybody starts to get a part of. And then I'm pretty sure I thought recently like man, I'm surprised that like, Game of Thrones isn't bigger in like the soccer community. And then lo and behold, I see this pop yep. up on my news feed and I'm like, yep, nope, that makes sense. I'm surprised they didn't do like a, a, a game. Like they came out, Adidas came out with shoes, Game of Thrones yep. shoes. Why didn't they do the whole kit, a soccer kit? Imagine a Game like of the Thrones house inspired. of the houses. Oh, I need this you're now. Done, you're done effed up. If game if someone Adidas. is out there is a really good graphic designer, can you come up with like a Game of Thrones inspired soccer kits? I'm and like sure send if you them my give way? it a Google too, like oh <laughs> you yeah, probably find you know that. maybe I'll do that. Or like Game of Thrones crest soccer, like yeah, Game of Thrones. But I'm inspired. lazy, so if someone yeah. wants to DM me that, yeah, come my on, my personal Instagram is at Louis Fern L U I F E R N. <laughs> I'm actually genuinely curious, like if someone sees it, please do like a House Lannister crest, Stark Ooh. House Stark soccer crest. That'd be cool. Yo, I'm just giving out free ideas. Someone make it and send it my way. I want to see it. <laughs> send it my way. <laughs> but alrighty, guys. Oh, sorry. Before we jump into the main topic of this week, side little, little note. Um, B, did you know that Landon Donovan and Jermaine Jones came out of retirement and are playing in a professional soccer league? You know, I knew Landon Donovan was retired, but I did not know Jermaine Jones was retired. Fair enough. I, I think he was playing on the Galaxy up until last year, but... Um. Basically, both players have come out of retirement. And they're playing in an arena soccer league. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know what arena soccer is, it's indoor soccer. Um, if you're in the if you're in the north of America, I'm sure you know what it is. If you're in the south, Google it. We just posted an article uh, a couple days ago about this. And if you want to know more about it, go on our website www.troublesoccer.com. It should be on the front page. So yeah, if you want to know why they came out of retirement and what the MASL is a little bit more in depth, you can check out that video on our YouTube or, like I said, on our website www.troublesoccer.com. You know, arena soccer always got a little uh, a bad rep among. I feel like some of our friends, like they don't enjoy playing arena soccer, but me, quite frankly, I think the aspect of arena soccer is really cool. It's, it's like when we did the, the episode about futsal, like it's just a different form of soccer. Like the rules are slightly different and yeah. like, it's something that I, I used to actually really not be the biggest fan of the fact that there are walls and that the ball just kind of bounces everywhere, but it takes a different set of skills than like regular soccer does. Yeah. And so like you, you'll meet people who are phenomenal in arena soccer, but out on a big field, they're not as great because the, the space is very different or whatever. And so I just think that it actually could contribute a lot to American soccer culture if more people started paying attention to it. Yeah. And the MASL, it, it's been growing. So it could potentially fill that hole that we have when, and it could really fill that hole that we have when the MLS is in off season during the winter, especially because, you know, we always push for wanting the MLS to adapt the winter calendar, yeah. but it won't. So now if you're looking for soccer in the winter closer to home, I would actually look it up. See if there's an MASL club near you because it actually is pretty interesting. I it is pretty fun. fun. Um, and that's also because Brendan and I have played it for a majority of our lives. So we yeah. do, we have a, we're a little bit biased. We're though, biased so. for sure. <laughs> Check out the video though. You'll, you'll learn a lot more. But all right, B, moving on to our main topic of this week. This is actually something that I have been, uh, I had a tab on this for about a year now since I first heard of it happening. Uh, so about a week and a half ago or two weeks ago, I guess, the Canadian Premier League kicked off for its inaugural season. The Canadian Premier League uh, has become the number one top division soccer league in Canada. And it's really interesting because Canada has not had a professional soccer league since 1992. Uh, and so it's been about like, what is that? I was born in 93, 25, don't know how to do math. So like 26 years ago, 27 years ago, yeah. they haven't had professional soccer in Canada. Basically, the stated aim of the CPL is to, quote, improve national soccer talent and the sport in Canada with several rules in place to ensure this. These include a minimum quota of Canadian players on team rosters and starting lineups and a requirement for domestic under 21 players and a university draft. So they're basically trying to pull different elements of what they've seen work in other leagues, um, especially because they are trying to promote the game in Canada. And they seem like they're very, going to be a very modern, progressive league overall. 
uh, especially because each of their club's new identities were very well designed and they took the time to really try to make everything look as modern as possible. They did. And But before we start talking too much about it, I wanted to dive in a little bit more into the nitty gritty of what the league is, how it's structured, and just to give you guys a better rundown of what it is rather than just us diving in and talking about it. So the Canadian Premier League consists of seven teams from across five of Canada's 10 provinces. The regular season lasts from April to October and consists of two separate tournaments, the spring season and the fall season. And the season culminates in the CPL championship held between the two season winners. The CPL champion will earn a berth to the CONCACAF Champions League, playing against teams from Central America and the Caribbean. If you want to know more about the CONCACAF Champions League, we, we have done an episode on it. So find that in our, in our directory and give that a listen. Also, all Canadian Premier League teams will play in the Canadian Championship against Canadian clubs from other leagues. So that means that despite them being in their own league in this Canadian Championship, they can still play the three Canadian MLS franchises. Alberta and Ontario have two teams each from their provinces, while British Columbia, Manitoba, and Nova Scotia each have one. What is very striking about their teams and their locations is that they have not placed teams in Toronto, Montreal or Vancouver, which are three of the largest cities in Canada with the biggest metro populations, with Toronto and Montreal being the two largest city in Canada. And this is really weird because when you're thinking about building a league, you want to put it in front of as many people as possible, right? You want to put it in your biggest markets. So you might be thinking, why would they avoid putting teams in their biggest markets? Well, we're going to get to that in just a little bit. But before we get there, I want to kind of keep talking about the Canadian Premier League as as a league. So... What's very interesting about the way that they operate is that the teams in the Canadian Premier League, they follow a club-based system that is much more similar to the European model in which the clubs are independent members of the league rather than franchises like in Major League Soccer and other North American sports league. This is huge uh, because, you know, as we've seen, there's been a lot of problems with how the MLS operates as a league. It's not news to anybody. <laughs> we've talked extensively. Uh, and so the fact that the CPL looked at this and was and, and looked at the MLS and was like, oh, that doesn't seem to be working over there. Let's make our league a club-based model, which should, in fact, allow it to grow very quickly. And on that note, the league commissioner, David Klanakin, I'm sorry if I fucked up his name, my bad, Uh, confirmed that the league's plan is to expand gradually, uh, wanting to reach 10 clubs by next year, 2020, followed by getting to 14 clubs in 2024 and 16 clubs in 2026. Uh, The commissioner also stated that in regards to the 2020 expansion, that they're already working really hard with about five to six locations right now for the additional three spots to make it to 10 by 2020. Uh, Interesting thing about one of their clubs, FC Edmonton, they actually used to play in the most recent incarnation of the NASL, uh, which we covered oh, almost a year ago now, uh, here in the States before they actually left and joined the Canadian Premier League. And it was really cool because this is an established club that has a history uh, joining the Canadian Premier League to give it a little bit of weight when it comes to like, you know, uh, having already having fans and having viewers True. and everything. And also having their own ground and like uh, uh, facilities because the commissioner of the league also said that their biggest obstacle in expanding the Canadian Premier League is the lack of facilities. But hopefully the CPL will kind of force Canadian soccer to modernize and join the 21st century. Um, And then lastly, uh, the commissioner and league have actually stated that their goal is to have promotion and relegation in the Canadian soccer league system as more teams join the league. So that's a lot to unpack there. Big time. We just went through a bunch of stuff. But basically, I want to take the, the first little bit of this and talk about is the Canadian Premier League going to be good for Canadian soccer? Personally, I think yes, based mostly on where the teams are starting right now. You know, I feel like they have a plan to eventually get in the major cities with the expansion teams that we've just stated. Potentially, we're not they haven't confirmed or denied, you know. I'd like to believe that like with with like there's there's only so many locations, you know, yeah. before you have to eventually make it to the biggest cities in all of Canada. You know, um, it's all, but at this, within that same breath, it's interesting that there are no teams that you don't think that wouldn't you want to get this Canadian Premier League off to a good start with a team or two in one of these major heart cities. But, you know, one of the biggest reasons for that is the fact that there are three franchises in those cities in the MLS. That's true. So, you know, I do want to unpack that a little bit more, but when it comes to, You know, just having a league, you think it's going to be good for Canadian soccer? Because, you know, Canadian soccer, those are two words that really never really go well together. Like, no one really, like, 
it's been making strides. Like Toronto yeah. FC won the MLS Cup a couple years back, and like you know, it's been growing. And so I just feel like I feel like there was a love for soccer in Canada. Mm-hmm. I just feel like it was never really administered well. Probably very similar to here in the states. Yeah. Um, but just they didn't have a league. Uh, do you think that overall with the league kind of establishing and having, you know, giving Canada a product that is wholly Canadian to support, you think that will help grow the Canadian national team potentially? Or do you think that like, you know, it'll it'll help a little bit or what are your thoughts? On I that? think it'll definitely help because it gives more eyes to players we may have missed, you know, even even for development. You know, maybe there's a, a, a kid who's pretty young, but has a, is, has aspiring talent that, you know, one coach sees on the national team. My, or, you know, it's like he wouldn't have seen if he wasn't part of this Canadian Premier League um, because, like, the mandated law that there has to be X amount of Canadian players. So the national team, I would be stupid if they didn't have eyes on this. Right. Um and they definitely will. Yeah. I just think that you make a good point. I think of the example of like Alfonso Davies, who played for Vancouver Whitecaps, yeah. you know, got signed to Bayern, has been in Bayern since January. Um, he's one of those players that he's a real success story for hopefully for the Canadian soccer in the future, you know, came up in, in an MLS academy in Vancouver, you know, is a Vancouver boy, like, you yeah. know, going to be playing, for, he has, is playing for Canadian men's national team, but you know, there's only there were only three franchises in the MLS, so only so much that you could develop Canadian talent there. Yeah, a lot of the best Canadian talent is being developed overseas, if at all. Yeah, and a lot of people, I, I mean, I'm sure there have been. I remember reading about some Canadian players actually choosing to play for England because they had like heritage from England, ah. and so you know they have Canada has missed out on some of some good talent. So yeah, and even those big three teams that you just said, they have a bigger pool to choose from. Like they have all of like the United States to choose from just because they're from Canada doesn't mean that they right. aren't involved in the MLS draft. So this Canadian Premier true. League is going to be way more focused on bringing in talent from all these provinces. Wow, I haven't even thought of that because that, yeah, okay, sure, the draft maybe isn't the main way of acquiring players for most clubs in the MLS, yeah. but it is for a lot. And that draft is from American universities, not Canadian yeah. universities. So that's and a I very wonder, interesting. I do thing. wonder if the Canadian they'll they'll only draw from. I'm Canadian. assuming they'll only draw like yeah. draft from the Canadian university. Yeah, because, because it, they, it's a Canadian league. It's, yeah. It doesn't expand outside and, of Canada, and it, and it probably fills both the university draft quota and the Canadian player quota. Um, True. Yeah, it'll be a good way of getting good talent from university teams. On it'll give them a streamlined path to the pros, yeah. and you know maybe once the league grows bigger they'll they would probably rather put more focus on the academy system but don't forget this is a league that launched a week and a half ago so yeah. the draft will be crucial for them getting young talent through the pup pipeline into the uh, league and i actually like the draft as a mechanism for bettering crappy teams true i just don't like the way that it works in the mls because of the closed system i think that in a like they said, if they want to get promotion relegation, the draft is a great way to help struggling clubs that manage to survive another year in the top flight. True. To give them like, hey man, we want you to succeed. Take the best college player. I think that'll be a really cool mechanism to help those struggling teams. But it doesn't guarantee them safety, which I True. like. I know. Um, Eventually, once they get to the level of having promotion and relegation. Well, one thing I want to ask you, B, is like... I. I I've been thinking about, like, do you think that the Canadian Premier League will be treated like the little brother league in a way? Similar to how, like, in America, we view the Canadian Football League as, like, a little brother league to the NFL. Like, you know, what I mean by this is, like, maybe I'm overstepping here and kind of, like, trying to subject myself to what Canadians might think, despite the fact that I'm not Canadian. But I feel like there might be this, like, meant, like, basically because Canadians are used to having teams in their cities participate in American sports leagues. Uh, the NHL has seven different teams in Canada. The NBA used to have two teams in Canada, but now they only have one. And the MLS has three Canadian franchises. And so because of that, I feel like it's created like this weird thing. Like if Canada ever wanted to have like a basketball league, which I think they do, it's never going to be as big as the NBA. No. And so I feel like a, maybe a majority of the Canadian basketball fans all support Toronto, even if they're not from Toronto, you know? Yeah. But I also feel like there are definitely going to be people from these areas that are going to fall in love with the sport. Especially if they're underrepresented in a way, right? If you think about Precisely. it. Precisely. Like, you know, because there is only one NBA team in, in in Toronto, like, 
sure, maybe you root for them as a Canadian, but like if there was a club that, you know, Canada's a massive country, but what if there was a team that represented who you were a little bit better, you know? Yeah. Um, and like, look at England. Look how many soccer teams are in England. Look how many, how many leagues are in England. There are, you can support more than one team. Absolutely. And of course, like this is, it's just because of the way that Canada and America play so nice when it comes to sports, it creates this weird thing. It's like, can the CPL break off and stand apart and potentially, you know, grow way more or will it forever be kind of tied down? Right. Cause usually I don't like the idea of mandating a roster spot for a specific nationality. Um, but I think it's actually okay for these coming years to really grow the game in a Canadian way. And like, yeah, you want people to be invested in it because they want to invest in the clubs, not because of the star power. Yeah. Versus clearly the way if you look at and contrast it with the MLS, the MLS, most people just care about the star power. Big time. Side note, LA Galaxy played the Red Bull this past weekend. Yeah. And there was a dude who had a Red Bull jersey that said Zlatan on it. Just because Zlatan <laughs> was playing there. And it, like that's that's that is I mean, in some ways, I mean, you can even look to PSG and Neymar, you know? Like this huge money signing who, you know, was just like the amount of jerseys they sold from him. And they you know, made PSG like a household. Neymar basically helped make PSG a household name across the world. Oh, but, yeah. You know, if Neymar leaves tomorrow, a majority of those fans are going to leave with him. When Zlatan's oh, out of the, the league, most of those fans are going to go with him. And so I actually think that the Canadian Premier League has a chance of really, if they focus on community and they focus on building an organic league that is a Canadian product. I think that would be a really good way for them to not suffer in the ways that the MLS has suffered. And so overall, it seems like the Canadian Premier League is trying to adapt all of the best parts of North American sports, but they want to do more. They, Like I said, they want to implement promotion relegation. The clubs that exist, they exist independently from one another and they aren't run like the, the MLS. So my question is, can the Canadian Premier League eventually overtake the MLS as a league? Because... This season, we've been seeing the MLS struggle. Most, a lot of its teams have been struggling with attendance, and the TV ratings are way down in the MLS. And so, if Canada is able to create an organic league, uh, do you think it's possible that they could overtake the MLS? No, I don't think they'd be able to take over the MLS un- unless that the expansion goes well and they get promotion relegation. I think that they'll steal viewers who want to see a competitive season throughout and not just, hey, it's like the best. Because it, it's different from our American sports, you know? Yeah. And it'd, it'd be closer to us going to England or going to these other countries that have these promotion relegation leagues. Yeah. So it's closer. We might be a little bit more invested in that. Um. So I think it hypothetically could, but... The expansion needs to go well. Because, yeah, absolutely. And this is definitely something that, you know, speaking of the hypothetical, because a lot of new leagues do have issues as they're starting out. Uh, this is if everything goes well, the Canadian League can expand and get to a good size in the next couple of years and eventually implement that. But I think you're right. I think that there are a lot of people in North America as a whole that want to see promotion relegation as the basis of the sport. And I'm thinking of people who are along the border with Canada, you know, northern or upstate new york uh even us in new england it's only a five and a half hour drive to montreal we can get to canada within five hours like you know i might be tempted if there was a game relatively close that i could get to just to go experience a different league yeah i feel like a lot of people would be interested because we've been seeing that the mls is this self-contained thing that is kind of weird and self-indulgent whereas the canadian premier league is hoping to be more about the sport than the spectacle you know and so I think there's a chance, but of course it hinges on so many ifs, yeah. right? But I, I'm so glad to see that they are wanting to implement promotion relegation. And maybe, who knows, maybe it rubs off on the MLS. Maybe all of a sudden when the Canadian Premier League starts to get uh, to become a super hot commodity, if it ever does, the yeah. MLS might look at it and go, shit, guys. Yeah. If they start taking viewers and stuff, it's like, well, why are they taking viewers? They do a little research. It's like, oh, they enjoy. Because this actually leads into my next probably the most fascinating aspect of this whole conversation for me is about those three cities that the Canadian Premier League did not put clubs in. And I'll remind you, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver. One very interesting thing is about what impact does the CPL have on the three Canadian franchises in the MLS? And what does that mean for those cities and the Canadian Premier League? Because after last week's episode where we talked about the MLS growing to 30 or more teams... 
I found it very strange that the MLS is trying to grow so much, but three of those locations or three of those slots are occupied by teams from Canada. And so it, one thing that I thought of is, do you think the MLS might try to expand more into Canada? Because they might see, a, uh, because now that we've mentioned it, right, there's a chance that they might not stop at 30. Maybe they want to continue. What's stopping them from, say, like MLS looking around going, ooh, there's a there's a new soccer league coming up in, in, in Canada. They seem to be pulling really good numbers. Maybe we add a fourth team in Canada. Yeah, maybe that's we a good go point. To, maybe we go to Halifax and try to get a, a, a club in Halifax. Yep, or, or like British Columbia. That would be interesting. That would, because if, yeah, because if, if this Canadian Premier League goes well, then what's to stop the MLS from having a new person to come in from Canada? Or if oh. they, or if they lobby for that, like, hey, it's really nice to join the MLS. Like we you have a great place up here in Canada. Like the the Canadian Premier League's doing great. What's to stop you from building here in like Toronto and But then of course like if they do have promotion and relegation and they have expansion for Canadian Premier League, why if you're a Canadian millionaire, why would you want to join the MLS versus the Canadian Premier League? I mean, of course, you have to. Look, the way I want to, I want to say it is, I mean, the Canadian Premier League is a is a small league, whereas the MLS is established. They do m- somehow make some money, even though I don't. <laughs> we don't understand it, and it may be a Ponzi scheme for all we know. But they seem to be happy. The owners in the MLS, and so yeah, it, it's this weird kind of thing. And so, you know, when it comes to those cities, the Canadian Premier League basically made a bet. They were like, you know what? We're launching a brand new league. We don't need to ruffle any feathers until we get settled. Let's avoid those three cities and those three markets. Because they're like, you know what? They already have an MLS franchise. We're a new thing. Let's try to ease our way in. Now, with that being said, one thing that I found very interesting in a, in a parallel, in the only other parallel that I found in world soccer, I thought about how there are Welsh teams in the English Premier League. And think about it, like Swansea, yeah. you have uh, Cardiff, and uh, there was one other one that I can't remember, but both of those clubs have played in the Premier League. They've been in the English League pyramid, despite the fact that they're Welsh. And there actually is a Welsh League, which I didn't know existed, yeah. but, you know, they do. And, you know, Scotland has its own league, yep. Northern Ireland has its own league, and Wales has its own league, but the only overlap is these Welsh teams the Swansea and Cardiff they they've played in the English league system throughout their entire existence and they've never wanted to join the Welsh league because it doesn't make as much money as the Premier League no exactly but it became one of those instances of being grandfathered in because when they were created as clubs it was before the the it was before Wales had a legitimate soccer pyramid so so they ended up staying for decades in the English uh, soccer system and today no one thinks anything of it do you yeah. think that maybe in many many years it'll kind of be the same with Toronto FC the impact and even Vancouver Whitecaps yeah I, I could see that you know because I feel like some of these teams just grew up maybe playing in in a league that they were closer to because there wasn't anything really around not to say that there weren't other leagues going around but I feel like there was some reason for these teams to start in the leagues they started with Right. Well, but then now to that point, you know, you have uh, when the MLS put teams in Canada, this was in that period where Canada didn't have a league. So now if you're a Canadian soccer fan and you're looking at it and you're like, well, what if I don't want to support the MLS? What if I want to support a club from another league that just happens to still be in those cities? And this is where I find it to be the biggest possible come up for the Canadian Premier League. Um we dedicated an entire episode talking about rivalries and how important they are to uh, building up the love of a game and how much it means in soccer. So weirdly enough, the Canadian Premier League has the ability uh, to create something astonishing here. So let me kind of give you an idea. Milan, Sevilla, Madrid, Manchester, London, Glasgow, Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, Buenos Aires. These are all massive cities in the world that have more than one club. And anytime any of those clubs from that city plays each other in a local derby, it pulls in so much viewership. Like it means so much to the people of that city and it just creates so much more fervor for the game. Now, because the fact that Toronto and Montreal are the two biggest cities in Canada and adding Vancouver, that makes it three of the top 10 biggest cities in Canada. The Canadian Premier League has 
the way of of creating a rivalry that won't feel contrived the yeah. way that it does in MLS. That's true. When they create like a rivalry in the MLS, they're not rivals because they all partake in the same system. They're all franchises of the same entity. You know, the owner of the Galaxy and the owner of LAFC, there's no reason for them to dislike each other. They make the same money because yeah. they own the same That's thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, they don't really compete. No. Sure, maybe for the supporters, it doesn't matter that the ownership doesn't compete, but... I think it should. I think yeah. it does, you know? Like, yeah, it definitely it, adds more organic grassroots feel to what a rivalry is. Right, and so basically what I'm thinking is, imagine that the Canadian Premier League says, you know what, we're finally stable. Let's add a team in each of these cities. We're going to add one in the city of Toronto, we're going to add one in the city of Montreal, and we're going to add one in the city of Vancouver. This is a way of creating a rivalry between, you know, all the rivalries in the world have animosity stemmed from something. Yeah. You know, and... I think that we've touched upon a little bit of, of what could cause a rivalry between these these two leagues, right? If the Canadian Premier League puts teams in those three cities, all of a sudden you have people who have to make a choice. They're like, "Am I going yeah. to continue? Ch- am I going to continue to support a American product that is being shoved down our throats as a franchise like a McDonald's, or do we adopt something wholly Canadian?" And I'm sure that's going to create a split between the fan bases because Big there time. are people who have supported Toronto FC for years and Montreal impact for years and vancouver vancouver is one of the clubs in north america that have the most history they've been around since the 60s you know what i'm saying like uh, now you create a system where you're gonna have two clubs in a city even if they play in two different leagues it's a way that you can really boost canadian soccer by creating that friction create that rivalry just naturally i think it'd be one of the coolest ways that the canadian really can really blow up i wholeheartedly agree i think it'd be It'd be stupid. It'd be almost stupid not to, because that would just create like the most organic rivalry, and just that split. I think is something that us as New Englanders don't really feel because we have a baseball team that's generally specific. We have a football team that plays in our state. We but there's there's no right like there's no real rival a rivalry. Yeah. And like what what happens in every other city in the world is that. You have to face people in your office, in your in your school, in wherever you work or go and spend your time with people who are fans of other clubs. Yeah. Like, and even if it's the same city, like when I was in Sevilla, you had people who were friends most of the time, but both of them supported either Sevilla or Real Betis, and like it creates a it creates something that is nonstop. It's always being talked about, and every time they're, you're pl- the, the this local derby is being played, it's all that that city can talk about, and so that just grows the fervor and like. It really, really helps to grow the sport. Like, could you imagine, like, Canadian Premier League goes off without a hitch. They're expanding like crazy. Then all of a sudden, Toronto comes in and gets two teams. Like, that would be, like, a north north and south. Like, that would yep. be so cool. Not to mention Toronto FC. And that's, yeah. like, three teams now in the biggest city in Canada. And, yep. like, it just creates this big, big separation. But, like, and you may be thinking, oh, why does it matter if they separate if they're never going to play each other? Well, like I said, there's still the Canadian Championship. And... There's not that many clubs in Canada, so they're going to have to play each other. Like, just because they don't play in the same league doesn't mean they won't be playing in the same cup. Don't yeah, forget, exactly. every, country, every country has its own cup competition. And so, those matches could... Re- and they talk, they're talking about boosting Canadian soccer. That would be the quickest way to make headlines. Oh, yeah, like this, this like, uh, Nova Scotia comes up and makes it all the way to the final against Toronto, you know? Like, that would... Toronto FC from MLS. Yeah. Or even, like, let's say a Toronto team makes it to the final against Toronto FC from the MLS, exactly. but it's, like, all of a sudden it becomes Canadian Premier League versus the major league soccer and it's must view television yep. all of a sudden in america we're watching uh, americans will get involved and be like oh we want to support the msl te- or the mls team i gotta and then pick, canada- i gotta pick a team now <laughs> <laughs> um and so it could just be massive man i just think that that would be really really cool if they did that plus uh, if they put one in montreal i would i'd be more willing to drive in the summer to montreal yeah one of my favorite cities on the planet that's true you love know? me some montreal It'd be really fun to go experience a different type of smaller, like, not like, I looked at some of, like, the stadiums and their capacity is, like, 5,000, you know, like, not huge, but, like, it's their premier league. But I would rather them build something small than do what they do in America, which is force big stadiums that are empty half the time. Exactly. Make a good environment with a small stadium that you could possibly build up, you know what I'm saying? Like, get a small field that, like, maybe you can add renovations, you can add different stands to in a couple years once it grows, um, 
And especially because they have to fight with, you know, there's so many sports being played in Canada that people love so much more than soccer. So they have to fight hockey, fucking lacrosse, like Canadian football, American football. Like there's so much, but I think that things have been good to go for the, so far. Okay. Yeah. Mind you, it's been two weeks of actual play, but things have been going well. So as far as we can tell, um, and I hope they continue to go well. Yeah. There's a, you know, there's a couple, there's a couple, uh, teams in Ontario yep that are relatively close to our border yeah so like that that's a trip that's like six seven hours maybe, maybe if that maybe we have to make a trip out in the next year or so check out some Canadian Premier League but both the teams don't have the coolest crest no oh, no which which were the two clubs Forge FC and York Nine. Oh, true I actually dislike both of those I dislike both of those I find that they, well. one thing that the Canadian Premier League did not as great as other I, leagues is that I wish they would have adopted you, people may think it's generic, but I feel like sometimes when people try to force a name too much, like York Nine and Forge FC, like you're trying to be, you're trying to beat people over the head with yeah. like symbolism. Like, why not just go something simple? Like, like look at Calvary FC. Like, yep, Calvary has a very, very simple, simple crest. It, they, they, and they're called the Calgary Cavalry FC, which, but they have a historical reasoning behind it. But you know, you have. Uh, what is it, Halifax FC? Or yeah, Halifax the Halifax Wanderers. Wanderers. I thought they were, they were cool. I yeah. like their crest. I, I just don't like how it's so contrived. Like, couldn't we yeah. maybe just go with something? I do like Pacific FC. Pacific that FC is very cool. That one was pretty cool. cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I feel like they're they're they almost tried a little too. My favorite modern. name out of all of them is FC Edmonton. Football Club Edmonton makes yeah. very, very. You know what? Within within two seconds, I know what they do. They are a football club from Edmonton. Yep. If you told me Forge FC, where would they play? Fuck, fuck, do I know? I like Pacific FC though because they're on the Pacific Ocean. Like I get that. Like that's yeah, kind of cool. And they're on Vancouver Island, which isn't Vancouver. It's, yeah. It's, you know, it's this own kind of thing. But then, and even Halifax Wanderers Football Club, I get that. They're in Halifax. They wander. It's yeah. easy to understand. And they are up there, dude. Yeah. That's like, they're not super far from us either. But for us to get there, we'd have to drive through mainland Canada. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Um, but either way, we could probably ramble about this for hours. But I just think it's really awesome that there is another top flight league happening in North America. It's only going to better the soccer being played across North America um, because it will, you know, it will push the people in the MLS to be better, it'll push. And if it doesn't, it'll just be another example of what we could do in America if we had a better system, if the Canadian Premier League goes well. So, you know, lots of things riding on this for many people. It's not just the Canadians. Definitely want to take some time and talk about how it impacts us here in America. Um, But yeah, man, I'm excited. I hope they, I hope they keep it up. I definitely want to go to a match. I want to, I want to watch a little bit. I think it would be really, really cool to see Premier League with independent teams playing so close to our borders absolutely have you picked a team that you like i haven't yet i was really i'm really holding out hope that montreal will get a canadian Premier league team i really like montreal yeah, that would be pretty <laughs> sweet i'm, I'm wa- i feel like i'm gonna be a wanderers guy this yeah, season. yeah halifax wanderers nova scotia yeah all uh, for this season i'm gonna i'll support Va- I'll, I'll i'll support pacific fc okay we'll do that okay. me and b are gonna follow well, on the opposite all end right, of cool. canada see who does the better i will say though some of their kits are fly some of the kits yeah like the pacific purple pacific and teal purple like, one very is really, cool. really cool they did like i said they did a really good job of modernizing uh the club identities jerseys and, and everything like you that. can buy the pacific one but the Wanderers shop does not open. Really? Yeah, you go to click like, oh, like, because no. I do. I would like. I'd like to plan on getting it. Oh yeah, because really cool. it, it'd be fun. But we'll keep an eye on that. Hopefully, definitely. Halifax Wanderers will fix their web their web store and we'll go from there. But all right, guys, what did you think? Uh, let us know what your thoughts are on the Canadian Premier League. Do you think that the Canadian Premier League can overtake the MLS in popularity? Can it possibly influence American soccer in any way by just being really good? Uh, Let us know what you think. But that's it from us, and we'll catch you guys next week.